This episode is brought to you by my supporters on Patreon. If you like this channel, please consider showing your support at patreon.com slash clockworkshow. I'm going to start this one off with a question. Did the world make life, or did life make the world? Maybe that feels like a trick question. Heck, maybe it feels more philosophical than scientific. But I'm asking this very specifically because of the way that we, you know, human beings, think of ourselves and our place in the world as we hurtle through the early 21st century. We think of the world as this delicate, innocent place that we suddenly brutalized by our suddenly industrialized society. I mean, that part's true, but if you look at the whole story of life, our most ancient ancestors have been causing really drastic changes for a while now. In an earlier video, I talked about how pretty much all the oxygen in our atmosphere, which is the only thing that makes life on the surface of Earth possible, comes from living things. 20% of the air you breathe, and the only part of the air that actually matters to you, was gifted to you by a tree, fern, or most likely a cyanobacteria. Life did that. But this isn't the end of the story, because most of the rest of the air you breathe is almost completely worthless to you. And without some of your most distant cousins making it useful, life on Earth would have barely made it past the unicellular stage. Today, let's dive deep into the most underrated chemical process in the world. I'm talking about atmospheric nitrogen and the protein complex that pulls it apart, thereby unlocking all the complexity life on Earth has produced. Let's fix some nitrogen, y'all. And if you think getting all existential and emotional about biochemistry is fun, I'd love it if you subscribe to this channel. Meanwhile, let's set the scene a little bit. If you're talking atoms only, you're mostly made up of oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and then nitrogen. You get a little bit of trace iron and phosphorus and fun stuff like that in there too, but these are the big four right here. I'm gonna focus on nitrogen. Nitrogen is a critical component to every amino acid, every single letter of your DNA, and even the membranes that hold your cells together. It's really hard to find a single fundamental part of your body that doesn't need nitrogen to get built. And all of these elements that make you up have sources that are easy enough for living things to use, except for nitrogen. Which is weird, because 78% of our atmosphere is made up of nitrogen. Why can't our bodies just use something that you're completely surrounded by at all times? Nitrogen exists in our atmosphere as diatomic nitrogen, with the chemical formula N2. That's two nitrogen atoms stitched together. They're stuck together like this by way of a triple bond. It's one of the strongest, most unbreakable bonds in chemistry. All of that nitrogen is completely unreactive, totally useless for life. So how are a bunch of squishy living things supposed to break into this and make it useful? And if the nitrogen in our atmosphere is so useless anyway, how do we have life in the first place? Well, there's forces on this good Earth that are powerful enough to make nitrogen actually useful. Two of the main ones are lightning and solar radiation. Lightning zaps its way through the atmosphere and is hot enough to burn this triple bond in N2. Most of the nitrogen would then stick itself back together, but since our atmosphere is round about 20% oxygen, odds are you'll also get some oxygen and nitrogen to combine to make nitric oxide, or NO, which can precipitate down and become useful for living things. So why do we need living things to fix this themselves? Well, honestly, this process was enough a really long time ago if you go back to the very ancient history of the Earth. But then, simply, evolution took its course and suddenly there was a lot of competition for nitrogen and nitrogen compounds. Evolution is slow, but if you give it enough time, it responds great to big pressures like this. So what did evolution make for us here? How can living things even come close to tackling this triple bond? I've shown you how bacteria and plants break water molecules apart in the past, but water is made up of weak, puny single bonds. We need way more power to break apart this diatomic nitrogen. So cyanobacteria and other nitrogen fixers evolved this beautiful little complex. Meet nitrogenase. You've got the iron protein on the left here, and the molybdenum iron protein on the right. Researchers shortened this to their chemical symbols. So after hours of research, I just called these the Fe and Mofe proteins, even though that's not even close to how you'd pronounce them in real life. You gotta make your own fun here at Clockwork HQ. Anyway, the iron protein here is where the party starts. This iron protein has places for ATP to bind. 
and it'll use energy from ATP to pump electrons and protons into the molybdenum protein here. And then there's this P cluster in the middle that connects the two, forming a kind of metallic bridge between the Fe and MoFe protein. But largely, this protein on the left is the engine providing energy for the molybdenum iron protein on the right to do the actual business of pulling nitrogen molecules apart. Now, breaking apart N2 takes an insane amount of energy, so for the mechanism I'm going to show you, it'll take 16 ATP molecules just to turn one N2 molecule into two molecules of ammonia and some byproducts. Here's the chemical reaction on screen. Notice how I said the mechanism I'm going to show you, and not, like, THE mechanism. Nitrogenase is incredibly complicated, and since the process of fixing nitrogen is so complex and energy-heavy, we don't actually have a clear view of how it precisely works. We've got some really great proposed mechanisms that scientists are working to prove out, but it'll take more research to show definitively what this mechanism is. I'm using the mechanism outlined in this paper, but I'm linking a bunch more in the Twitter thread where I cite my sources. Link in the description, or feel free to check it out at this underscore clockwork on Twitter. And I really do encourage you to check this out, because this is a really important area of study. If we can nail this mechanism and figure out how it precisely works, then we can get closer to figuring out how to engineer our own nitrogenase, and figure out a way to engineer plants that can fix their own nitrogen, which will help us get rid of our dependency on chemical fertilizers, and all the tiny little problems they have since we use just so many of them trying to, you know, feed all the people on the planet. Anyway, since we're like, super deep into this video already, I'm going to keep this simple. Nitrogen fixing happens in this beautiful molybdenum, iron, and sulfur structure inside the MOFA protein. Every time an electron and proton gets pumped into this structure, it changes a little. There are eight total steps to this mechanism, but I'm going to fast forward through the first four since all they do is add four protons to this structure, setting up the conditions where N2 can actually have a place to bond, which is right here on this iron. Remember, N2 is just INCREDIBLY unreactive, so we have to make this cluster really energetic before we can even invite this boring old molecule to the party. Two of these protons are kind of stabilizing the structure, while two more are forming the business end of MOFA around this one iron atom, which is the atom that N2 is going to associate with. And now, we'll get to the really chaotic part. Hang on tight. Our iron complex is just going to keep shoving protons and electrons into the structure until something happens. The iron atoms are going to keep nitrogen stable while a fifth proton enters the complex and makes NH2 down here. That's almost stable, but remember, we're trying to take care of all three slots of this triple bond. Hydrogen can only ever take one slot, one bond, so we need to keep everything stable until... Proton number six shows up, making a second H2. Rocket nerds will look at this and realize we've made hydrazine, which is an incredibly dangerous chemical sometimes used as a rocket fuel. That's cool for explosions, but less cool for biology. So nitrogenase keeps more protons coming. Proton 7 bonds up here, finally making one molecule of ammonia, that's NH3. That molecule is free to leave and will go on to get turned into DNA and proteins and lord knows what else. Meanwhile, we've got this extremely unstable NH2 here, right up until an eighth and final proton enters our cluster and completely completes the last ammonia molecule, and then resets the whole cycle. The cool thing about nitrogenase is that, because of this structure, the iron protein over here can just keep pounding away, constantly pumping electrons and protons into the molybdenum iron protein. If there's no nitrogen around, the whole complex can just reset after step 4, which is why this intermediate is called the Janus Intermediate. They can go forward or backward from here. This is what makes studying biochem cool after a while. Sure, this is an incredibly complex structure with steps so convoluted that science is still having a hard time sorting out their finer details, but at the end of the day, what we have here is a structure that just keeps poking protons at N2 molecules until they turn into something useful. At the end of the day, life has a very simple and limited set of rules it can follow, but thanks to billions of years of evolution, those rules can have complex consequences. But just keep watching this mechanism a few more times and think about what I asked at the beginning. Did the world make life, or did life make the world? The answer really is both. Life is an evolutionary process, and therefore uses whatever chemistry is available to it. That's why you see biochemical systems that are just direct copy-pastes from other ones. 
Life just works, and therefore only uses what already works. So for a while, the world had enough nitrogen for life to thrive, but eventually there was enough pressure for life to figure out its own way of fixing nitrogen. Life is constantly iterating and changing the world around it a little and iterating again. Life on Earth has been changing Earth since the very beginning, and now, with us, it's just happening at a rate that's unfathomably quick, at a rate that evolution simply can't keep up with. But I don't need to get into the specifics of that. I think it's really important to see evolution and our place in the world as more of a partnership than anything else. And I hope nitrogen fixing is a way for you to see that we've been terraforming this world for quite a while now. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And hey, as always, thank you so much for making it to the end of the video. If you liked this and want to help keep the channel going, I strongly encourage you to support this channel on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash clockworkshow to find out how you can help. This year, I'm going to expand the channel to have more frequent releases, as well as a live stream series where we go in even more depth into biochem. And that will only be possible via direct support. Another way you can help is by sharing this video anywhere and everywhere if you liked it. That helps me appease the algorithm gods and keeps pushing the momentum forward. I would like to also point out that this video was inspired by a comment I got in a video I made last year where I very quickly glossed over nitrogen fixing. If there's something you want me to cover, comment about it below. I clearly can be bullied into making videos you want. Like I said before, nitrogen fixing is a super complex topic, and I strongly encourage you to check out my sources and supplementary materials over at this underscore clockwork on Twitter. Link to the sources thread in my bio. As always, these videos are only good because of the support I get from the incredible community over at Biocord. Are you a life sciences professional, student, and or enthusiast looking for the best life sciences community on the internet? Be sure to check out Biocord over at discord.gg slash biology. Either way, thanks so much for hanging out until the very end here. As always, I like to leave you with peace, love, and molybdenum. Everyone be well. Thank you so much.